Every day, you and I get bombarded with negative news. And just like our bodies become what we eat, our minds become the information that we consume. If you want to stay positive, it's so important that you also listen to stories that inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we interview world-leading experts dedicated to solving the world's most pressing problems. And if you stick around, I promise you will not only be as informed as if you watch the news, you will feel uplifted, inspired, and have more positive energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Hi and welcome. Today, Great.com talks with Amy Baird, who is the deputy director of biglife.org. And if you haven't heard of them before, they are an anti-poaching NGO based in Kenya and Tanzania. And there they protect elephants, rhinos, lions, and the whole Amboseli Amboseli ecosystem at large. I'm sure Amy will correct me on my pronunciation there. And if you're new here into this podcast, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because today we're going to talk about how NGOs can work with local communities to protect the wildlife in uh, Africa. So Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to coming on and teaching us about uh, your organization. Thanks for having me. So how would you describe Big Life to someone that has never heard of you guys before? Big Life is based in East Africa, in Kenya and Northern Tanzania. Um, It's primarily an anti-poaching organization. That's how we started over 10 years ago, uh, to protect elephants, rhinos, lions, as you already said. Um, But it's grown as an organization based on its success with poaching and has really turned into a community-based conservation model that spans everything from supporting education and healthcare to um, preventing elephants from raiding crops and, and supporting the local community and living in an area that has really large animals and, and sometimes dangerous animals. So help me understand then, why would a anti, anti-poaching organization look at you know, education and healthcare and help protecting the communities? It's a really great question and one we get quite a bit. The core of our ethos is really that if conservation supports the people, then people are more likely to support conservation. And we see that in really direct ways in Kenya in particular. For example, um, lions is a great example. If you have uh, a herd of cattle and sheep and you're moving through a grazing area and lions are trying to take out your cows, you are going to be motivated financially to protect your cows and your sheep. And you're not going to want those lions to take your livelihood away because maybe that's how you're paying for your kid to go to school or whatever. So, you know, to help people not throw a spear at a lion, Big Life has implemented a series of programs, one of which is compensation. Mm -hmm. So if we have a lion that takes out a cow, and the herder has done everything possible to protect that cow, we do provide compensation so that they are disincentivized to go out and retaliate and take out lions. Um, That's just one example. We also have um, fences that help protect farms from maybe hungry elephants that don't know that they're not supposed to raid a tomato crop, which might be the same same situation where it's it's your livelihood and how you're going to pay for your kid to go to school. So really understanding that these people that live in this community are cohabitating with these animals, you have to make it worth their while or they're not going to support conservation. It can't happen in a silo. So really making sure that these people benefit from the conservation initiatives that are happening there in meaningful ways. And that often means financially, but it also means, you know, supporting them, um, as you say, with healthcare and education and making sure that they are getting direct benefits from the work that's happening. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, you're painting a picture of like the impact this huge animal can have for the, for the lives of the farmers. So it makes a lot of sense to work together with them in collaboration. So what are the big threats then to these uh, big animals? I guess, you know, farmers is one thing, but is it other, other types of poaching as well? Yes. So 
I mean, poaching was a huge problem in the ecosystem when Big Life started back in 2010 and actually built on the success of an organization that had already been in place there for nearly 20 years with a community ranger program. So poaching really started to spike in like 2008, 2009 in this particular ecosystem and Big Life Strangers were able to step in and, and grow as the organization grew and, and really focus on, on stopping poaching. So poaching is, is an issue across Africa and, and has been an issue in the particular ecosystem where Big Life works. But as our ranger program grew and we were able to really focus on poaching, we realized that there were other emerging issues um, that the animals face there, uh, one of the biggest of which is diminishing access to habitat and wilderness areas. As the human population grows and, and continues to develop and urbanization happens. Obviously, there's less space for these really large animals to move around. And elephants migrate hundreds, thousands of kilometers. So they really need the ability to move through an ecosystem and sometimes that ecosystem has farms and houses and roads in place. So making sure that corridors are protected and making sure that the people that are you know, living in this area are both protected from the wildlife and the wildlife is protected from <laughs> those human uh, habitats as well um, has become a huge focus. So, you know, back in 2016, I've been big with Big Life now for almost six years. And when I first started, you know, we were still experiencing poaching, you know, a handful of animals, handful of elephants a year were being lost to poachers. And then we started, you know, really looking at the numbers and realizing we're losing far more elephants to human wildlife conflict. We're, you know, upwards of 10, 12, 14 elephants a year were being lost um, in human wildlife conflicts with farmers where, they were going in and, and raiding crops in the middle of the night because watermelons and tomatoes and whatever else is growing is delicious for an elephant and not, you know, recognizing that, you know, the farmers that have those crops are maybe going to retaliate with spears and, and want to make sure that they're protecting their crops. So from that, you know, from focusing on the poaching, we really started to see that there was this whole other area of wildlife um, protection initiatives that needed to be implemented. And so we sort of scrambled to put the funds together to implement a new fencing project. And, um, you know, so that started several years ago now. We're now up to 100 kilometers of electrified fencing in the most um, heavily farmed area where Big Life operates. So we've been able to see a reduction in crop rating and human wildlife conflict in that area in particular by upwards of 90%. Wow. And the community is extremely supportive of it. They're really grateful to have the fence. And it's made a huge difference, obviously, in their financial income and, and safety and living in that area. And it's made a huge difference for the elephants that are moving through that area and being able to migrate safely and you know, stay in the areas where they need to stay to stay safe. It's having been to a safari once and seen these huge animals and like how raw nature is. It's unbelievable to imagine that humans are going to live side by side and trying to grow tomatoes or watermelons next to these huge animals. So I really see the importance of the work that you guys are doing. And I can imagine that also setting up these fences that that is creating, it's almost like you're protecting an, an area as well. So, because it's natural, of course, that humans settle more and more of this wide land, but if there is a fence already, that might serve to protect some of the uh, wide land. Yeah. Is, is that happening? Well, I mean, the area that Big Life operates in is traditionally um, Maasai, that's the tribe that uh, lives in that area. And Historically, the Maasai are pastoralists and cattle grazing uh, culture. They view their cattle as their wealth. And so it used to be very nomadic and, and moving through to grasses and, and see, seeking um, greenery for their cows. But, you know, it's, the country is changing really dramatically. And whether it's, you know, for cultural reasons or because of climate change or, you know, just seeking other avenues of wealth, Farming has really started to develop in an area where traditionally it was just cows. And so now you have crops and irrigation and water tanks and, you know, a whole infrastructure of settled people in an area where it used to just be uh, cows grazing. So 
the whole ecosystem has really changed very dramatically and will continue to change as, as all places do grow and evolve. Um, but it's definitely presented a different set of issues um, than used to exist in the Amboseli ecosystem um, by far. So how do you see the, the ecosystems that you guys are involved in? How do you see them developing? What kind of challenges do you think are going to come up ahead? Definitely the space issue is the biggest challenge that, that we're looking at, you know, if we're looking, you know, in the next six months to five years to 10 years. Um, a lot of the, most of the ecosystem has been communally owned for a long time. And the group branches is what they're called, um, are starting a process of subdivision where they're titling out individual parcels um, that can be bought or sold or traded. Um, and so at this point, you know, a huge challenge and, and really important one is making sure that in that process, that there are areas set aside for wildlife um, and conservation, because it's really important to realize, like looking at, you know, going back to your early question about how the people benefit, one of the biggest things that big life offers is employment. We're one of the largest employers in the entire ecosystem with our ranger system. We're now up. You know, over 300 rangers, total employees is over 500 people. Um, but the other big employer in the ecosystem is tourism. It's the safari lodges that are based around Amboseli National Park and the other conservancy areas where you have this incredible wildlife. And this is a huge driver for the economy of all of Kenya, but especially the Amboseli ecosystem. And so if you're looking at a very rapidly changing ecosystem that's maybe not thinking big picture about the animals that rely on the space to move through to access these you know, national park areas that drives this huge chunk of the economy, you're really looking at a, an economic catastrophe in the long run. And so it's not just about making sure that there's space for these animals. It's also about making sure that the people that live there continue to have the jobs and the employment at these lodges, you know, working in the rest, you know, restaurant, whatever, um, that are going to be so critical. So keeping space available for wildlife is as important as keeping space available for wildlife so that the tourism economy continue to be successful there. And I mean, people go to Kenya to photograph elephants. They don't go to Kenya, you know, to photograph pictures of tomato farms. So while it is really important to have agriculture and have a diverse economy, you have to protect the spaces that are left. And the Amboseli ecosystem is one of the last places that has large migrating herds of elephants anywhere in Africa that I'm aware of. But, you know, this particular ecosystem is very famous for them because the Amboseli National Park that's there in the, in the core of the ecosystem has really regular water supply from Mount Kilimanjaro, the snows that melt, you know, run down and, and fill the swamps. And so there's water and food and it's just a really special ecosystem. But the national park itself is quite small and, you know, the animals that rely on the park for safety and food and, and relaxation need to be able to move more widely than, than the boundaries of the park allow. So I'm rambling a bit, but I definitely, you know, land is definitely in in space is where we're going to be needing to focus our efforts, unfortunately. And it put a big smile on my face when I read on your website and saw that Nick Brandt was one of the founders, his uh, images of elephants, like you described, really moved me. I saw them in a, museum here in Stockholm amazing pictures mm. so it's so important to yeah to conserve and preserve this ecosystem so what is the government's point of view then are you working with governments or trying to influence them somehow yeah absolutely I mean particularly on the the wildlife security side and and the anti-poaching side we work very closely with the Kenyan government and the Tanzanian governments um, the Kenya Wildlife Service is the you know federal agency that oversees their ranger program, um, but they don't have the resources necessarily to reach all of the areas outside of the national parks in particular. So that's sort of why Big Life was started. You know, in the ecosystem where we work, there's Kilimanjaro National Park, Amboseli National Park, Chulu Hills National Park, and then further away is, is Sava West National Park. There's all these very famous national parks that have really wonderful wildlife areas, but in between those national parks where you have massive herds of migrating elephants, you have community lands that aren't necessarily fully protected. And so Nick Brandt, as you mentioned, um, used came to the area quite a bit and did a lot of early photography 
Um, some of his most famous photos that you've seen in Photografiska um, definitely came from that ecosystem. And the photo in our, in our logo actually is a photo that Nick Brandt took of Igor. And that was an elephant that Nick had photographed several times and, you know, was able to get quite close to that elephant, really knew that elephant, was familiar with him and a lot of the other elephants in that ecosystem. And each time he came back to the ecosystem, he realized that there were fewer and fewer of those elephants around. They were, they were being lost to poachers and there wasn't anyone really filling that hole. The government didn't have the resources to fund a major anti-poaching, you know, effort in that area outside of the national park. And most of, you know, the wildlife crime that was happening was happening outside of the national park. So that's really how Big Life got started was to partner with the government to protect the wildlife in the areas where maybe they didn't have the resources to reach. And um, Nick was able to work with some of his collectors back in the States to raise some seed funding and then, and then partnered with Richard Bonham um, and the Maasai Land Preservation Trust that was already operating in the field there to create what's now turned into Big Life Foundation. So it's, it was developed in concert with working with the government and the government is very much involved and, you know, doing anything in the ecosystem there, whether it's building a fence or a wildlife crossing or a conservancy area. Um, you can't do that without the cooperation of the government and their full support. Um, and so it is, it is a really critical part of everything that we do. And we're really grateful to, to partner with the Kenya wildlife service and, and other government agencies to make the work there happen. Mm -hmm. That's so critical. I can imagine that. And it's a super interesting story given Nick's background. So someone, what can someone do to get involved then? Is it a good idea to uh, go there, maybe uh, see the elephants, try to climb Kilimanjaro, uh, mm -hmm. or should someone stay at home and do some kind of, uh, maybe try to influence or donate? What is a good way to help these ecosystems? Those are the two key things that I would say. Um, number one, if if you have the resources and the means to actually travel and visit these places and see them, you know, you you vote with your dollar. And when you spend money on tourism, it shows that the economy needs the tourism, you know, to to thrive. And if there's not tourism happening, they will look for other sources of income, whether it's farming or whatever. So so actually visiting and seeing the wildlife in the wild, you know, there's very few places left where you can go see big animals and especially diverse ecosystems like we have in in the Amboseli ecosystem. I, I live here in the United States and to to see wildlife is a huge endeavor to travel to very remote national parks and if you're lucky you'll see a bear. If you're lucky you'll see um, you know a bobcat or something and and we do have wildlife here but it's very few and far between and and it's definitely not we don't have woolly mammoths anymore we don't have big herds of buffalo you know we wipe them all out so the fact that there's still an ecosystem where you can go see giraffes and buffalo and lions and, and rhino and elephants you know moving together and and living in these ecosystems is incredible. And, yeah. you know, we need to do everything we can to preserve those and, and going and taking pictures and spending your money at safari lodges is one of the biggest ways that you can show your support for protecting those ecosystems. But it's also a very expensive endeavor. So I recognize that not most people can't afford to travel halfway around the world or wherever you're traveling from um, to stay at, at an eco lodge in, in an area and, and go on safari. Although I hope that you have the opportunity to, because it is life-changing. Um, but if not, you know, supporting organizations that do conservation work in these areas is critical. Um, there's a lot of um, government assistance and institutional funding that goes into protecting these areas, but, you know, our, our budget is primarily raised from private individuals around the world that care about this ecosystem and want to make sure that we continue to have elephants for our, our kids and grandkids in the future to, to be able to travel and visit at some point. So, um even small donations make a huge difference. Um, we're really grateful to have the support of, of our monthly donors, you know, five, 10, 20 bucks a month over the course of the year really does add up in concert with other people that are doing the same and provides a really stable source of funding. So we need all the help we can get because it's very expensive to, to fund our rangers and, you know, grow all these programs. We had to put a lot sort of on pause in 2020 with COVID and really, Kind of conserve our budget and see what how things were going to go and now we're looking ahead and realizing that you know we have to get back on track and 
we have to grow some of our programs and it's going to, it's expensive. So all the help we can get um, definitely, but traveling and donating are probably the two biggest and best ways to help conservation anywhere in Africa. Travel and donating. Got it. Amy, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, my uh, pleasure. You, you really me. painted a picture of uh, the ecosystems there and uh, you rekindled my excitement to go back to a safari and visit again because yeah, it was truly life-changing the first time. Well, come to the Amistella ecosystem. There's a lot of lodges and wonderful tourism outfits that would love to take you and show you all the wonderful wildlife that the area boasts. So please do. It's definitely on my bucket list. So thank you. My pleasure. And for you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because that is showing the algorithms that this is important. So more people can hear this conversation and learn how they can stop poaching and start to protect the big animals. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. What is great.com? That is the most common question that we get. And the shortest answer I can give you is that we are a company that is moving money from the online casino industry and donates it to charities that is helping the environment. The long answer Unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you today, but if you're curious, definitely Google whatisgreat.com to learn more.